Flatlander is a collection of short stories about Gil, the Arm Hamilton. It stands out to me in Larry Niven's known space universe for several reasons. The first and foremost is that Gil is the only person in known space that I know of anyway that has an imaginary arm. You see, when Gil was younger, he tried his hand at being an asteroid miner, and in the process, he lost his arm. He eventually got a transplant, but in the meantime, he forgot that he only had one arm one day and reached for a cigarette with his missing arm and picked it up. It turned out that Gil had latent psychic powers that were awakened by his mind and his lost arm combined with an algae environment of space where even a slight push could move an object. If he had been on Earth when he had lost his arm, the gravity of the planet would have been too strong for his budding psi powers, and when he reached for that cigarette, nothing would have happened. He wouldn't have been able to lift the cigarette. Gil decided that his asteroid mining career was over, since he could only get a new arm back on Earth. But even after getting his transplanted arm, he luckily kept his imaginary arm, as he called it. Gil was also Unarm, the Amalgamated Regional Militia. This was the name of the UN police force Gil worked for, that dealt with special cases dealing with international problems like overpopulation. The title, Flatlander, may sound similar to Crashlander, another collection of short stories in the known space universe, but Gil is about as far opposite of Beowulf Schaefer as possible. Beowulf, the main character of Crashlander, is lucky, scheming, carefree, and fun. Gil Hamilton, on the other hand, is a troubled, unlucky man who doggedly chases his prey regardless. Gil lives in a dystopian near-future Earth, another reason why he stands out in the known space universe. Yes, World of Patavs and Protector are also set in the near future, and Gil Hamilton was even trained to be an arm by Lucas Gardner, who is in both World of Patavs and Protector. In one of the stories, Gil states that Lucas is 180 years old, the same age as when Protector happens. So Flatlander is what Gil is doing on Earth, while Lucas is saving the human race from the pack in space. This future Earth is plagued by wireheads, overpopulation, unlicensed pregnancies, and organ leggers. A new kind of drug is invented, only it's not a drug at all. Medicine and neurology has progressed to the point where anyone that wants to pay the money can get wires implanted into their brain that when attached to a power source, will send a very small amount of electricity directly to the pleasure centers of their brain. This is pure ecstasy, to the point where the addiction is almost impossible to escape. And the wireheads are usually not productive members of society. They just sit there plugged into a wall, with no desire to ever do anything else. Since electricity is cheap, and they were not actually doing anything illegal, there was nothing anyone could do about it. Some would stay there until they starved to death. Others could lead semi-productive lives as their battery kept them stimulated as they worked. The fool's smile constantly on their face, regardless of what was happening, was a dead giveaway, however. But Gil's specialty was to hunt down organ leggers. Medicine had also progressed to the point where people like Lucas Gardner could live well past 150 with the help of organ transplants. As the people lived longer and longer, they needed more and more transplants. But where would the transplants come from? People were not dying, and those that were, had old, worn-out organs. Yet nobody wanted to die, so what was the solution? Organ leggers. Like bootleggers, but they would smuggle organs instead. So where were they to get these organs? People began to disappear. Anyone who was broke down on the side of the road, or passed out in an empty bar, wouldn't be seen again. The homeless populations disappeared overnight, and the rich lived to amazingly old ages. The record was over 220 years old. The middle class didn't want to die either, however, but they couldn't afford the exorbitant prices of the organ leggers. Some turned to less rigorous organ leggers without reputations. Sometimes, they just became more organs themselves because of this. And sometimes, their sloppiness would lead to both the organ legger and the transplantee getting arrested. This gave the state of Virginia an idea. They made it law for the death penalty executions to be done by the transplant hospitals themselves. If you were executed, you got parted out to the rest of society to repay your debt. 
This ended up happening to many organ leggers themselves, of course. Other states and countries all picked up the idea fast, and soon the whole world was doing it. But there were still not enough organs to go around. So, slowly, the governments of Earth started to increase the numbers of crimes that resulted in the death penalty. Anything the people would vote for. Murder? Of course. Attempted murder? Well, that's just as bad. Rape? Well, we definitely can't have them in society. Insanity? Why fix them when their parts can fix us instead? But the hunger was never satiated. There were always more people being born, more people living longer, more people needing transplants. So on it went. Soon, evading your taxes was the death penalty. Having a kid without a permit on the overpopulated earth would get both you and the fetus killed. Even running too many red lights became a death sentence. But the people were already being more careful. You aren't as likely to risk a 200 year long life as you are a 75 year long life. So as crimes became a death penalty, people would just stop doing them. So the organ leggers never had even a dent in their business. The only thing that seemed to make any difference at all were the armed agents constantly hunting them. But the result of that was not what you would desire. The organ legger gangs just got bigger smarter, and more devious. Now, instead of hundreds of small organ legger gangs, there were just a few that ran the entire world. Well funded and well connected, as most politicians and CEOs were rich and didn't want to die either. Then, someone got an idea. What about all the people in suspended animation? There had been a long time running idea that if you got incurably sick, you could just freeze yourself and get fixed in a utopian future when the cure had been invented. Before all the death penalties, this was also how they dealt with incurable insanity. And then, on top of that, there was a disturbing trend for a while. The freezer kids. There was a point in time when the typical depression of teenagers gave them the idea that they should freeze themselves, and that way they could be thought out in the future when life was better. Clearly, they didn't understand that they were just suffering from normal teenage hormones that had nothing to do with the rest of the world. So, they did it anyway. Tens, or maybe even hundreds of millions of teens and twenty-somethings worldwide scraped together enough money to freeze themselves in the hopes that they would wake up in a better future. Instead, they had doomed themselves to become a stockpile of organs. There were hundreds of millions of stored frozen people of all types. Why not use them for the good of our organ transplants? When they have tried to revive them, near a third died anyway. They were all as good as dead already, they said. And they must have been crazy anyway to freeze themselves. Why not put them to good use, they said. Insanity was already punished by death anyway. It's just following the laws, they said. Predictably, the laws passed, and the freezers began to empty. They took the healthy young teens first, because they had the least damaged and healthiest organs, not like those accident victims that were frozen after they already died. This is where Flatlander starts. Yep, that's right. None of that was spoilers. It's just the world where Gil Hamilton happens to live. So the organ leggers finally took a serious blow, the freezer kids had enough organs to end organ legging almost completely. The legitimate hospitals could now give everyone any organ they needed. This made them desperate. This made them sloppy. Finally, Gil Hamilton started to make real progress in his hunts. Gil Hamilton is a detective, and so his stories are mysteries. I'm sure I don't need to say this, but mysteries revolve around a mystery that will be revealed at the end. So if you intend on reading this book and don't want any mystery spoilers, then now's the time to stop. But having said that, these aren't really the kind of mysteries you can guess. Niven owns all the physics and psychology. He invented all the tech and the society. What's possible and what's not is entirely up to him. You can make fun guesses, sure, but in the end, that's all they are. I will be telling you the full story of one of the short stories in this book. Now, before we get into it, I need to say, mysteries are not like other stories. Sometimes, 
Seemingly insignificant details are actually the solution, and other times, things that seem significant are thrown in just to be a red herring. So I'm not going to be able to give you every clue and every misdirect. That would literally just be me reading the entire story to you verbatim. So instead, I'm just going to give you the important stuff. The arm building had been abnormally quiet for some months now. We needed the rest, at first. But these last few mornings, the silence had had an edgy quality. We waved at each other on our paths to our respective desks, but our heads were elsewhere. Some of us had a restless look. Others were visibly, determinedly busy. Nobody wanted to join a mother hunt. This past year, we'd managed to cut deep into the organ legging activities in the west coast area, pats on the back all around. But the results were predictable. Other activities were going to increase. Sooner or later, the newspapers would start screaming about stricter enforcement of the fertility laws, and then we'd all be out hunting down illegitimate parents, all of us who are not involved in something else. It was high time I got involved in something else. This morning I walked to my office through the usual edgy silence. I ran coffee, carried it to my desk, punched for messages at the computer terminal. A slender file slid from the slot, a hopeful sign. I picked it up one-handed so that I could sip coffee as I went through it and let it fall open in the middle. Color holographs jumped out at me. I was looking down through a pair of windows over two morgue tables. Stomach, Stomach to, to brain. brain. What a hell of an hour to be looking at people with their faces burnt off. Get eyes to look somewhere else and don't try to swallow that coffee. Why don't you change jobs? They were hideous. Two of them. A man and a woman. Something had burnt their faces away down to the skulls and beyond. Bones and teeth charred, brain tissue cooked. I swallowed and kept looking. I'd seen the dead before. These had just hit me at the wrong time. Not a laser weapon, I thought, though that was chancy. There are thousands of jobs for lasers and thousands of varieties to do the jobs. Not a hand laser, anyway. The pencil-thin beam of a hand laser would have chewed channels in the flesh. This had been a wide, steady beam of some kind. I flipped back to the beginning and skimmed. Details. They'd been found on the Wilshire sidewalk in West Los Angeles around 4.30 a.m. People don't use the sidewalks that late. They're afraid of organ leggers. The bodies could have traveled up to a couple of miles before anyone saw them. Preliminary autopsy. They'd been dead three or four days. No signs of drugs or poison or puncture marks. Apparently the burns had been the only cause of death. It must have been quick then, a single flash of energy. Otherwise, they'd have tried to dodge, and there'd be burns elsewhere. There were none. Just the faces and char marks around the collars. There was a memo from Bates, the coroner. From the look of them, they might have been killed by some new weapon. So he'd sent the file over to us. Could we find anything in the arm files that would fire a blast of heat or light a foot across? I sat back and stared into the hollows and thought about it. A light weapon with a beam a foot across? They make lasers in that size. But as war weapons, used from orbit. One of those would have vaporized the heads, not charred them. There were other possibilities. Death by torture, with the heads held in clamps in the blast from a commercial attitude jet or some kind of weird industrial accident, a flash explosion that had caught them both looking over a desk or something, or even a laser beam reflected from a convex mirror. Forget about its being an accident. The way the bodies were abandoned reeked of guilt, of something to be covered up. Maybe Bates was right, a new illegal weapon, and I could be deeply involved in searching for it when the mother hunt started. The arm has three basic functions. We hunt organ leggers, we monitor world technology, new developments that might create new weapons or that might affect the world economy or the balance of power among nations, and we enforce the fertility laws. Come, let us be honest with ourselves. Of the three, protecting the fertility laws is probably the most important. Organ leggers don't aggravate the population problem. Monitoring of technology is necessary enough, but it may have happened too late. 
There are enough fusion power plants and fusion rocket motors and fusion crematoriums and fusion seawater distilleries around to let any madman or group thereof blow up Earth or any selected part of it. But if a lot of people in one region started having illegal babies, the rest of the world would scream. Some nations might even get mad enough to abandon population control. Then what? We've got 18 billion on Earth now. We couldn't handle more. So the mother hunts are necessary, but I hate them. It's no fun hunting down some poor sick woman so desperate to have children that she'll go through hell to avoid her sixth month contraceptive shots. I'll get out of it if I can. I did some obvious things. I sent a note to Bates at the coroner's office. Send all further details on the autopsies and let me know if the corpses are identified. Retinal prints and brainwave patterns were obviously out, but they might get something on gene patterns and fingerprints. I spent some time wondering where two bodies had been kept for three to four days, and why, before being abandoned in a way that could have been used three days earlier. But that was a problem for the LAPD detectives. Our concern was with the weapon. So I started writing a search pattern for the computer. Find me a widget that will fire a beam of a given description. From a pattern of penetration into the skin and bone and brain tissue, there was probably a way to express the frequencies of light as a function of the duration of the blast, but I didn't fool with that. I'd pay for my laziness later, when the computer handed me a foot-thick list of light-emitting machinery and I had to wade through it. I'd punched in the instructions and was relaxing with more coffee and a cigarette when Ordaz called. Detective Inspector Julio Ordaz was a slender, dark-skinned man with straight black hair and soft black eyes. The first time I saw him in a phone screen, he had been telling me of a good friend's murder. Two years later, I still flinched when I saw him. Hello, Julio. Business or pleasure? Business, Gil. It is to be regretted. Yours or mine? Both. There's a murder involved, but there is also a machine. Look, can you see it behind me? Ordaz stepped out of the field of view, then reached invisibly to turn the phone camera. I looked into somebody's living room. There was a wide circle of discoloration in the green indoor grass rug. In the center of the circle, a machine and a man's body. Was Julio putting me on? The body was old, half mummified. The machine was big and cryptic in shape, and it glowed with a subdued, eerie blue light. Ordaz sounded serious enough. Have you ever seen anything like this? No, that's some machine. Unmistakably an experimental device. No neat plastic case, no compactness, no assembly line welding. Too complex to examine through a phone camera, I decided. Yeah, that looks like something for us. Can you send it over? Ordaz came back on. He was smiling, barely. I'm afraid we can't do that. Perhaps you should send someone here to look at it. Where are you now? In Raymond Sinclair's apartment on the top floor of the Roadwald building in Santa Monica. I'll come myself, I said. My tongue suddenly felt thick. Please land on the roof. We're holding the elevator for examination. Sure, I hung up. Raymond Sinclair. I'd never met Raymond Sinclair. He was something of a recluse. But the arm had dealt with him once in connection with one of his inventions. The fire stop device and everyone knew that he had lately been working on an interstellar drive. It was only a rumor, of course. But if someone had killed the brain that held that secret, I went. The Roadwald building was forty stories of triangular prism, with a row of triangular balconies going up each side. The balcony stopped at the 38th floor. The roof was a garden. There were rose bushes in bloom along the edge. Full-grown elms nestled in ivy along another, and a miniature forest of bonsai trees along the third. The landing pad and carport were in the center. A squad car floated down ahead of my taxi, then slid under the carport to give me room to land. A cop in a vivid orange uniform came out to watch me come down. He was carrying a deep-sea fishing pole, still in its kit. He said, May I see some ID, please? I had my arm ident in my hand. He checked it in the console of his squad car, then handed it back. The inspector's waiting downstairs, he said. What's the poll for? He smiled suddenly, almost secretively. You'll see. 
We left the garden smells via a flight of concrete stairs. They led down into a small room half full of gardening tools and a heavy door with a spy eye in it. Ordaz opened the door for us. He shook my hand briskly, glanced at the cop. You found something. Good. The cop said, There's a sporting goods store six blocks from here. The manager let me borrow it. He made sure I knew the name of the store. Yes, there will certainly be publicity to this matter. Come, Gil. Ordaz took my arm. You should examine this before we turn it off. No garden smells here, but there was something. A whiff of something long dead that the air conditioning hadn't quite cleared away. Ordaz walked me into the living room. It looked like somebody's idea of a practical joke. The indoor grass covered Sinclair's living room floor wall to wall. In a perfect 14-foot circle between the sofa and the fireplace, the rug was brown and dead. Elsewhere, it was green and thriving. A man's mummy, dressed in stained slacks and turtleneck, lay on its back in the center of the circle. At a guess, it had been about six months dead. It wore a big wristwatch with extra dials on the face and a fine mesh platinum band, loose now around the wrist of bones and brown skin. The back of the skull had been smashed open, possibly by the classic blunt instrument lying next to it. If the fireplace was false, it almost had to be. Nobody burns wood. The fireplace instruments were genuine. 19th or 20th century antiques. The rack was missing a poker. A poker lay inside the circle, in the dead grass next to the disintegrating mummy. The glowing device sat just in the center of the magic circle. I stepped forward, and a man's voice spoke sharply. Don't go inside that circle of rug. It's more dangerous than it looks. It was a man I knew. Officer 1, Valpredo, a tall man with a small, straight mouth and long, narrow Italian face. Looks dangerous enough to me, I said. It is. I reached in there myself, Valpredo told me. Right after we got here, I thought I could flip the switch off. My whole arm went numb, instantly, no feeling at all. I yanked it away fast, but for a minute or so after that, my whole arm was dead meat. I thought I'd lost it. Then it was all pins and needles, like I'd slept on it. The cop who had brought me in had almost finished assembling the deep-sea fishing pole. Ordaz waved into the circle. Well, have you ever seen anything like this? I shook my head, studying the violet glowing machinery. Whatever it is, it's brand new. Sinclair's really done it this time. An uneven line of solenoids was attached to a plastic frame with homemade joins. Blistered spots on the plastic showed where other objects had been attached and later removed. A breadboard bore masses of heavy wiring. There were six big batteries hooked in parallel and a strange heavy piece of sculpture in what we later discovered was pure silver, with wiring attached at three curving points. The silver was tarnished, almost black, and there were old file marks at the edges. Near the center of the arrangement, just in front of the silver sculpture, were two concentric solenoids embedded in a block of clear plastic. They glowed blue, shading to violet. So did the batteries. A less perceptible violet glow radiated from everywhere on the machine, more intensely in the interior parts. That glow bothered me more than anything else. It was too theatrical. It was like something a special effects man might add to a cheap late-night thriller to suggest a mad scientist's laboratory. I moved around to get a closer look at the dead man's watch. Keep your head out of the field, Valpredo said sharply. I nodded. I squatted on my heels outside the borderline of dead grass. The dead man's watch was going like crazy. A minute hand was circling the dial every seven seconds or so. I couldn't find the second hand at all. I backed away from the arc of dead grass and stood up. Interstellar drive hell. This blue glowing monstrosity looked more like a time machine gone wrong. I studied the single throw switch welded to the plastic frame next to the batteries. A length of nylon line dangled from the horizontal handle. It looked like someone had tugged the switch on from outside the field by using the line. But he'd have had to have hung from the ceiling to tug it off that way. I see why you couldn't send it over to arm headquarters. You can't even touch it. You stick your arm or your head in there for a second, and that's ten minutes without a blood supply. Ordaz said, exactly. It looks like you could reach in there with a stick and flip that switch off. Perhaps. We're about to try that. He waved at the man with the fishing pole. 
There was nothing in this room long enough to reach the switch. We had to send... Wait a minute, there's a problem. He looked at me. So did the cop with the fishing pole. That switch could be a self-destruct. Sinclair was supposed to be a secretive bastard. Or the field might hold considerable potential energy. Something might go bluey. Or Daz sighed. We must risk it, Gil. We have measured the rotation of the dead man's wristwatch. One hour per seven seconds. Fingerprints, footprints, laundry marks, residual body odor, stray eyelashes, all disappearing in an hour per seven seconds. He gestured, and the cop moved in and began trying to hook the switch. Already we may never know just when he was killed, Ordaz said. The tip of the pole wobbled in large circles, steadied beneath the switch, made contact. I held my breath. The pole bowed. The switch snapped up, and suddenly the violet glow was gone. Valprater reached into the field warily, as if the air might be red hot. Nothing happened, and he relaxed. Then Ordaz began giving orders, and quite a lot happened. Two men in lab coats drew a chalk line around the mummy and the poker. They moved the mummy onto a stretcher, put the poker in a plastic bag, and put it next to the mummy. I said, have you identified that? I'm afraid so, Ordaz said. Raymond Sinclair had his own auto dock. Did he? Those things are expensive. Yes, Raymond Sinclair was a wealthy man. He owned the top two floors of this building and the roof. According to records in his dock, he had a new set of bud teeth implanted two months ago. Ordaz pointed to the mummy, to the skinned black dry lips and the buds of new teeth that were just coming in. Right, that was Sinclair. That brain had made miracles, and someone had smashed it with a wrought iron rod. An interstellar drive? That glowing Goldberg device? Or had it been still inside his head? I said, we'll have to get whoever did it. We'll have to. Even so? Even so, no more miracles. We may have her already, Julio said. I looked at him. There's a girl in the auto dock. We think she is Dr. Sinclair's great niece, Janice Sinclair. There are only two ways into Dr. Sinclair's apartment. One, the roof carport, with cameras constantly monitoring it. And, two, the elevator, which does not have cameras, but does have a facial recognition system that only allows in specific people. No one was seen on the carport's cameras, and only a few of the doctor's closest friends were on the elevator computer whitelist. So, we have a locked room mystery with only a dead man and a single person inside. Clearly, it's got to be her, right? We find out that the device actually is designed to help space travel. It creates a bubble of inertialess space, where a byproduct of this is that it seems to speed up time inside the bubble as well, at a rate of about 500 to 1, meaning 500 seconds pass outside the field for every one second inside it. So now, there is the assumption made that whoever the killer is, they most likely tried to reach in the field to turn off the machine, just as Valpredo did. The only conceivable reason to kill Dr. Sinclair is for the machine, after all. So the killer would have wanted to take the machine with them. Yet it was still here. So, something went wrong. They used the nylon rope to turn the machine on, and then they must have made some attempt to turn it off. The only thing available in the apartment was the antique fire poker, which seemed to be in the right position after such an attempt. Janice Sinclair was missing an arm. That's why she was in the auto dock when the police arrived. The evidence against her seemed to be undeniable. But Gil kept up to his investigation anyway, and it's a good thing he did. There was a short list of people who could access Dr. Sinclair's apartment, but on that short list, there were two people missing arms. One had a transplanted arm just like Gil, but it was fully healed. It had to be from at least six months before, so it couldn't be him. The second was a man with a prosthetic arm. He could have reached inside the field and suffered no ill effects. Machines don't need blood flow, after all. The machine was running. I caught the faint violet glow as I stepped into the laboratory and a flickering next to it. And then it was off, and Jackson Barra stood suddenly beside it, grinning, silent, waiting. I wasn't about to spoil his fun. I said, well, is it an interstellar drive? Yes. A warm glow spread through me. I said, okay. It's a low inertia field, said Barra. Things inside lose most of their inertia. 
Not their mass, just their resistance to movement. Ratio of about 500 to 1. The interface is sharp as a razor. We think there are quantum levels involved. Uh-huh. The field doesn't affect time directly? No. It... I shouldn't say that. Who the hell knows what time really is? It affects chemical and nuclear reactions, energy releases of all kinds. But it doesn't affect the speed of light. You know, it's kind of kicky to be measuring the speed of light at 370 miles per second with honest instruments. Damn it. I've been half hoping it was an FTL drive. I said, Did you ever find out what was causing that blue glow? Barra laughed at me. Watch. He'd rigged a remote switch to turn the machine on. He used it, then struck a match and flipped it towards the blue glow. As it crossed an invisible barrier, the match flared violet white for something less than an eye blink. I blinked. It had been like a flash bulb going off. I said, Oh, sure. The machinery's warm. Right. The blue glow is just infrared radiation being boosted to violet when it enters normal time. Barra shouldn't have had to tell me that. Embarrassed, I changed the subject. But you said it was an interstellar drive. Yeah, it's got drawbacks, Barra said. We can't just put a field around a whole starship. The crew would think they'd lowered the speed of light. But so what? A slow boat doesn't get that close to light speed anyway. They'd save a little trip time, but they'd have to live through it 500 times as fast. How about if you just put the field around your fuel tanks? Barra nodded. That's what they'll probably do. Leave the motor and the life support systems outside. You could carry a god-awful amount of fuel that way. Well, it's not our department. Someone else will be designing the starships, he said a bit wistfully. Have you thought of this thing in relation to robbing banks or espionage? If a gang could afford to build one of these jobs, they wouldn't need to rob banks, he ruminated. I hate making anything this big a UN secret, but I guess you're right. The average government could afford a whole stable of these things. Thus combining James Bond and the Flash. He rapped on the plastic frame. Want to try it? Sure, I said. Art to brain. What are you doing? You'll get us all killed. I knew we should have never put you in charge of things. I stepped up to the generator, waited for Barrett to scamper beyond range, then pulled the switch. Everything turned deep red. Barrett became a statue. Well, here I was. The second hand on the wall clock had stopped moving. I took two steps forward and rapped with my knuckles. Rapped? Hell, it was like rapping on contact cement. The invisible wall was tacky. I tried leaning on it for a minute or so. That worked fine until I tried to pull away, and then I knew I'd done something stupid. I was embedded in the interface. It took me another minute to pull loose, and then I went sprawling backwards. I'd picked up too much inward velocity, and it all came into the field with me. At that, I'd been lucky. If I'd leaned there a little longer, I'd have lost my leverage. I'd have been sinking deeper and deeper into the surface, unable to yell to Barra, building up more and more velocity outside the field. I picked myself up and tried something safer. I took out my pen and dropped it. It fell normally. 32 feet per second per second, field time which scratched one theory as to how the killer had thought he would be leaving. I switched the machine off. Something I'd like to try, I told Barra. Can you hang the machine in the air, say by a cable around the frame? What have you got in mind? I want to try standing on the bottom of the field. Barra looked dubious. It took us 20 minutes to set it up. Barra took no chances. He lifted the generator about five feet. Since the field seemed to center on that oddly shaped piece of silver, that put the bottom of the field just a foot in the air. We moved a stepladder into range, and I stood on the stepladder and turned on the generator. I stepped off. Walking down the side of the field was like walking in progressively stickier taffy. When I stood on the bottom, I could just reach the switch. My shoes were stuck solid. I could pull my feet out of them, but there was no place to stand except in my own shoes. A minute later, my feet were stuck too. I could pull one loose, but only by fixing the other even more deeply in the interface. I sank deeper, and all sensation left the soles of my feet. It was scary. Though I knew nothing terrible could happen to me, my feet wouldn't die out there. They wouldn't have time. But the interface was up to my ankles now, and I started to wonder what kind of velocity they were building up out there. I pushed the switch up. 
The lights flashed bright, and my feet slapped the floor hard. Barra said, Well, learn anything? Yeah, I don't want to try a real test. I might wreck the machine. What kind of real test? Dropping it 40 stories with the field on. Quit worrying. I'm not going to do it. Right you aren't. You know, this time compression effect would work for more than just spacecraft. After you're on the colony world, you could raise full-grown cattle from frozen fertilized eggs in just a few minutes. Hmm, yeah. The happy smile flashed white against darkness. The infinity look in Barra's eyes. Barra liked playing with ideas. Think of one of those mounted on a truck, say on Jinx. You could explore the shoreline regions without ever worrying about the Bandersnatchy attacking. They'd never move fast enough. You could drive across any alien world and catch the whole ecology laid out around you, none of it running from the truck. Predators in mid-leap, birds in mid-flight, couples in courtship. Or larger groups. I think that habit is uniquely human. He looked at me sideways. You wouldn't spy on people, would you? Or shouldn't I ask? That 500 to 1 ratio, is that constant? He came back to here and now. We don't know. Our theory hasn't caught up to the hardware it's supposed to fit. I wish to hell we had Sinclair's notes. Alright, so, have you figured it out yet? I tried to make it pretty easy for you. Only a couple suspects in there. So which one of them did it? Believe it or not, you've got all the information you need. So, now, let's get to the final scene. It's an inertialess drive, sort of. Lower the inertia, time speeds up. Bear has already learned a lot about it, but it'll be a while before he can really... You were saying? Ordaz asked when I trailed off. Sinclair was finished with the damn thing. Sure he was, Porter said. He wouldn't have been showing it around otherwise. Or calling Bertha for a backpacking expedition. Or spreading rumors about what he had. Yeah, sure, he knew everything he could learn about that machine. Julio, you were cheated. It all depends on the machine. And the bastard did rack up his arm, and we can prove it on him. We piled into Ordaz's commandeered taxi. Me and Ordaz and Valpredo and Porter. Valpredo set the thing for conventional speeds, so he wouldn't have to worry about driving. We'd turn the interior chairs to face each other. This is the part I won't guarantee, I said, sketching rapidly in Valpredo's borrowed notebook. But remember, he had a length of line with him. He must have expected to use it. Here's how he planned to get out. I sketched in a box to represent Sinclair's generator. A stick figure clinging to a frame. A circle around them to represent the field. A bow knot tied to the machine, with one end trailing up through the field. See it? He goes up the stairs with the field on. The camera has about one chance in eight of catching him while he's moving at that speed. He wheels the machine to the edge of the roof, ties the line to it, throws the line a good distance away, pushes the generator off the roof, and steps off with it. The line falls at 32 feet per second squared, normal time. Plus a little more because of the machine and the killer are tugging down on it. Not hard, because they're in a low inertia field. By the time the killer reaches the ground, he's moving at something more than, uh, 1,200 feet per second over 500, uh, say, 3 feet per second internal time. And he's got to pull the machine out of the way fast because the rope is going to hit like a bomb. It looks like it would work, Porter said. Yeah, I thought for a while that he could just stand on the bottom of the field. A little fooling with the machine cured me of that. He'd smash both legs. But he could hang on to the frame. It's strong enough. But he didn't have the machine, Valpredo pointed out. That's where you got cheated. What happens when two fields intersect? They looked blank. It's not a trivial question. Nobody knows the answer yet, but Sinclair did. He had to. He was finished. He must have had two machines. The killer took the second machine. Or Daz said, Ah... Porter said, who's the killer then? We were settling on the carport. Valpredo knew where we were, but he didn't say anything. We left the taxi and headed for the elevators. That's a lot easier, I said. He expected to use the machine as an alibi. 
That's silly, considering how many people knew it existed. But if he didn't know that Sinclair was ready to start showing it to people, specifically to you and to Janice, who's left? X only knew it was some kind of interstellar drive. The elevator was uncommonly large. We piled into it. And, Valpredo said, there's the matter of the arm. I think I've got that figured too. I gave you enough clues, I told him. Peter Fye was a long time answering our buzz. He may have studied us through the door camera, wondering why a parade was marching through his hallway. Then he spoke through the grid. Yes, what is it? Police, open up, Valpredo said. Do you have a warrant? I stepped forward and showed my ident to the camera. I'm an arm. I don't need a warrant. Open up. We won't keep you long. One way or another. He opened the door. He looked neater now than he had this afternoon, despite informal brown indoor pajamas. Just you, he said. He let me in, then started to close the door on the others. Valpredo put his hand against the door. Hey. It's okay, I said. Peter Fye was smaller than I was, and I had a needle gun. Valpredo shrugged and let him close the door. My mistake. I had two-thirds of the puzzle, and I thought I had it all. Peter Fye folded his arms and said, Well, what is it you want to search this time? Would you like to examine my legs? No, let's start with the insulin feeder on your upper arm. Certainly, he said, and startled the hell out of me. I waited while he took off his shirt. Unnecessary, but he needn't know that. Then ran my imaginary fingers through the insulin feed. The reserve was nearly full. I should have known, I said. Damn it, you got six months worth of insulin from the organ legger. His eyebrows went up. Organ legger? He pulled loose. Is this an accusation, Mr. Hamilton? I'm taping this for my attorney. And I was setting myself up for a lawsuit. The hell with it. Yeah, it's an accusation. You killed Sinclair. Nobody else could have tried that alibi stunt. He looked puzzled. Honestly, I thought. Why not? If anyone else had tried to set up an alibi with Sinclair's generator, Peter Fy, you, would have told the police all about what it was and how it worked. But you were the only one who knew that until last night, when he started showing it around. There was only one thing he could say to that kind of logic, and he said it. Still recording, Mr. Hamilton. Record be damned. There are other things we can check. Your grocery delivery service. Your water bill. He didn't flinch. He was smiling. Was it a bluff? I sniffed the air. Six months worth of body odor emitted in one night? By a man who hadn't taken more than four or five baths in six months? But his air conditioning was too good. The curtains were open now to the night and the ocean. They'd been closed this afternoon, and he'd been squinting. But it wasn't evidence. The lights. He only had one light burning now, and so what? The big, powerful camp-out flashlight sitting on a small table against the wall. I hadn't even noticed it this afternoon. Now I was sure I knew what he'd used it for, but how to prove it. Groceries. If he didn't buy six months' worth of groceries last night, he must have stolen them. Sinclair's generator is perfect for thefts. We'll check the local supermarkets. And link the thefts to me? How? He was too bright to have kept the generator, but come to think of it, where could he abandon it? He was guilty. He couldn't have covered all his tracks. Peter Fye, I've got it. He believed me. I saw it in the way he braced himself. Maybe he'd worked it out before I did. I said, your contraceptive shots must have worn off six months early. Your organ legger couldn't get you that. He's got no reason to keep contraceptives around. You're dead, Peter Fy. I might as well be. Damn you, Hamilton. You've cost me the exemption. They won't try you right away. We can't afford to lose what's in your head. You know too much about Sinclair's generator. Our generator. We built it together. Yeah. You won't try me at all, he said more calmly. Are you going to tell the court how the killer left Ray's apartment? I dug out my sketch and handed it to him. While he was studying it, I said, How did you like going off the roof? You couldn't have known it would work. He looked up. His words came slowly, reluctantly. I guess he had to tell someone, and it didn't matter now. By then, I didn't care. 
My arm hung like a dead rabbit, and it stank. It took me three minutes to reach the ground. I thought I'd die on the way. Where'd you dig up an organ legger that fast? His eyes called me a fool. Can't you guess? Three years ago, I was hoping diabetes could be cured by a transplant. When the government hospitals couldn't help me, I went to an organ legger. I was lucky he was still in business last night. He drooped. It seemed that all the anger went out of him. Then it was six months in the field, waiting for the scars to heal. In the dark. I tried taking that big campout flashlight in with me. He laughed bitterly. I gave that up after I noticed the walls were smoldering. The wall above that little table had a scorched look. I should have wondered about that earlier. No baths, he was saying. I was afraid to use up that much water. No exercise, practically. But I had to eat, didn't I? And all for nothing. Will you tell us how to find the organ legger you dealt with? This is your big day, isn't it, Hamilton? All right. Why not? It won't do you any good. Why not? He looked up at me very strangely. Then he spun about and ran. He caught me flat-footed. I jumped after him. I didn't know what he had in mind. There was only one exit to the apartment, excluding the balcony, and he wasn't headed there. He seemed to be trying to reach a blank wall with a small table set against it and a camp flashlight on it and a drawer in it. I saw the drawer and thought, gun! And I surged after him and got him by the wrist just as he reached the wall switch above the table. I threw my weight backwards and yanked him away from there, and then the field came on. I held a hand and an arm up to the elbow. Beyond was a fluttering of violet light. Peter Fye was thrashing frantically in a low inertia field. I hung on while I tried to figure out what was happening. The second generator was here somewhere. In the wall? The switch seemed to have been recently plastered in, now that I saw it close. Figure a closet on the other side with a generator in it. Peter Fye must have drilled through the wall and fixed that switch. Sure, what else did he have to do with six months of spare time? No point in yelling for help. Peter Fye's soundproofing was too modern. And if I didn't let go, Peter Fye would die of thirst in a few minutes. Peter Fye's feet came straight at my jaw. I threw myself down, and the edge of a boot sole nearly tore my ear off. I rolled forward in time to grab his ankle. There was more violet fluttering, and his other leg thrashed wildly outside the field. Too many conflicting nerve impulses were pouring into the muscles. The leg flopped about like something dying. If I didn't let go, he'd break it in a dozen places. He'd knock the table over. I didn't see it fall, but suddenly it was lying on its side. The top, drawer included, must have been well beyond the field. The flashlight lay just beyond the violet fluttering of his hand. Okay, he couldn't reach the drawer. His hand wouldn't get coherent signals if it left the field. I could let go of his ankle. He'd turn off the field when he got thirsty enough, and if I didn't let go, he'd die in there. It was like wrestling a dolphin one-handed. I hung on anyway, looking for a flaw in my reasoning. Peter Fye's free leg seemed broken in at least two places. I was about to let go when something must have jarred together in my head. Faces of charred bone grinning derisively at me. Brain to hand. Hang on, don't you understand? He's trying to reach the flashlight. I hung on. Presently, Peter Fy stopped thrashing. He lay on his side, his face and hands glowing blue. I was trying to decide whether he was playing possum when the blue light behind his face quietly went out. I let them in. They looked it over. Valpredo went off to search for a pole to reach the light switch. Ordaz asked, was it necessary to kill him? I pointed to the flashlight. He didn't get it. I was overconfident, I said. I shouldn't have come in alone. He's already killed two people with that flashlight. The organ leggers who gave him his new arm? He didn't want them talking, so he burned their faces off and then dragged them out onto a sidewalk. He probably tied them to a generator and then used the line to pull it. With the field on, the whole setup wouldn't weigh more than a couple of pounds. With a flashlight? Ordaz pondered. Of course. It would have been putting out 500 times as much light. A good thing you thought of that in time. Well, I do spend more time dealing with these oddball science fiction devices than you do. And welcome to them, Ordaz said. Alright. I put a lot of effort into this uh, video, more than I think I've ever put into any other video. 
So hopefully it was worth it, uh, and if you're still here, uh, like you must be to be listening to this, I really appreciate it. Thank you, and it uh, seems you like my content, so maybe consider uh, to like, comment, and subscribe. And hopefully I'll see you back here for the next one. I'm thinking it might have to do Ringworld next. I mean, it is the one everybody knows. I'm sure it's the one a lot of people have been waiting for, so uh, I, I think that's got to come next. We will see, though. No promises. <laughs> but if you want to know for sure, you're just going to have to subscribe, and I'll see you for the next one. Thanks for watching.